Um, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Ali Reza Shirvani Juzdani, who is has been my PhD student for the last five years. Um, it has been my great pleasure to get to know Alex and to get to have some direction on his work. Uh, it's been incredible watching him evolve from an already talented software engineer to an incredibly talented uh, computer scientist and AI researcher. Uh, aside from the work you're gonna see today, Alex has also done really pivotal work on things like Camelot and our model of uh, belief-based planning that he's gonna mention just very briefly in the course of this presentation. But in addition to his dissertation work, Alex has made numerous other contributions um, to the research community. Uh, and it's been my great pleasure to be his advisor. And uh, so with that, Alex, take it away. Thank oh, you so much. I'm, I'm sorry, just one brief warning to everyone. This is being recorded. Um, and I, uh, committee is welcome to ask questions at any point. I would ask anyone who is not on the committee to please save your questions uh, for the end, for the, the question answer period at the end, just for the sake of time. Thank you, Dr. Ware, for, your, for the introduction. Hello, everyone, and welcome to my defense on models of personality and emotion for virtual characters in strong story narrative planning. I'd like to start my presentation by showing a video that showcases the integration of my work into our game engine Camelot. In this interactive narrative, the player plays the role of Tom, who, is, uh, who wants to acquire medicine. Now, in order to do so, he has to go to the forest and collect some herbs first. When he goes to the forest, it is possible that he is greeted by a bandit sh showing his sword. So in because he expects the bandit could rob him, he decides to go to the town and spend one of his coins to buy a sword from the merchant. After buying the sword, he no longer expects that the bandit could rob him and he can safely collect the herbs. So he goes to the forest and collects the herbs. After that, the herbs have to be brewed, brewed in, the, in the cauldron of the merchant shop. But Tom has already spent one of his coins, so if he gives the herbs to the merchant, he won't be able to buy the medicine from the merchant. So he decides to brew the medicine himself. Now, because the merchant doesn't give permission to everyone to use her cauldron, it is possible that she might get angry and try to attack the person. I actually forgot to share my sound. There we go. At this point, when the merchant approaches the player, the player sees no other option but to attack the merchant using the sword. Otherwise, he expects to get attacked by the merchant. So imagine a different scenario. Because the play, we don't want to force the player to attack the merchant, it is also possible for the merchant not to get angry in the first place and just let the player brew the medicine himself. Now in the rest of the presentation, I will discuss how I use the model of conflict to generate this type of story. Yeah, I'm going to try to stop sharing the sound. So my research is focused on interactive narratives. Interactive as in at least one of the characters is controlled by a human player. Interactive narratives are prevalent in various applications such as entertainment, in telltale games, for example, in education, such as the Crystal Island simulations, and in training, such as our police use of force training simulation, which trains police officers when and how to use force to de-escalate dangerous situations. In interactive narratives, it is important to enable the audience to willingly suspend their disbelief 
and if we provide the uh, audience with the possibility to do so, they can believe that what they're seeing is real, even though the context may be completely fictional, and then they can be immersed and more engaged in the experience. I think one of the important things that makes that enables the audience to suspend their disbelief is for the interactive narrative to have believable characters. But what makes a character believable? There are various believability models by other researchers that try to discuss these qualities. These are some of the qualities that these models believe make characters believable. Some of these qualities are universal to almost all story domains, such as personality, goals, emotions, and beliefs. And I focus on these four specifically in my research. There's a difference between designing intelligent and believable agents. The, the things that are different are when we, when we try to design intelligent agents, we want to focus on designing competent agents that can solve general problems in real world scenarios. We can use objective measures to calculate and evaluate those agents. For example, using accuracy, uh, efficiency, complexity, etc. But when designing believable agents, we are focusing on personality. The agent possibly can be incompetent if it matches their personality. We want the agents to be believable and we want to apply them to specific stories. For example, wall E is not a solution to a general problem. When we want to evaluate believable agents, we mostly need an audience to present those agents to that audience and then ask them questions and try to evaluate how believable they perceive those agents to be. Back to my interactive narrative discussion, narrative generation systems mostly fall on a, uh, within a spectrum from strong story to strong autonomy. On one side, we have the strong autonomy in which each character is an autonomous, independent agent that decides about their own actions and, a, and a, a narrative emerges from their actions and interactions, such as Sims or Dwarf Fortress, for example. On the other side of the spectrum, we have the strong story in which usually a centralized unit of intelligence controls every interaction with the player and tries to explore the space of all possible stories to plan a narrative and guide the user exper experience in a specific trajectory. There are also some systems that fall in the middle of that spectrum that enable their characters to make decisions about their actions independently and also include a centralized unit of intelligence to try to limit the actions that the characters can make. So but the main differences between strong story and strong autonomy is that the agent in strong autonomy, every character in strong autonomy is an agent, is an autonomous agent that decides about their actions independently. And a narrative emerges from that action. You can think of it as uh, improv, for example, that each, uh, each actor decides about their actions and reactions independently. In strong story, however, there is a centralized unit of intelligence that is the agent. You can think of it as a puppeteer, for example, controlling the puppets. So it is the centralized unit, it is the experience manager that decides about the actions of those puppets, but it will do so in a way that each of those puppets appear to be intelligent. Based on that, the experience manager tries to plan Plan, a, plan ahead for a narrative to guide the, the user experience in a specific way. In doing so, the experience manager has access to the space of all possible stories and explores them for specific branches in the story. But in strong autonomy, we are basically limited to the material that is extracted from the simulated scenarios. The pros and cons of the strong story kind of go hand in hand. So the, in strong uh, story, the experience manager has access to the full space of all the stories and it can foresee and plan specific scenarios, but that comes at a computational cost. 
So strong autonomy does not have access to all the scenarios and cannot ensure a specific scenario 100% of the time, but it, it, it does come with, uh, with a lower computational cost. The purpose of strong autonomy is usually just to provide the users with an engaging and interesting experience. But in Strong Story, the author has a specific set of goals that wants to be satisfied. So in, in an entertainment context, possibly, they, their goal might be to provide an interesting experience for the user. But in training and education, they might have specific goals that they want the player to adopt. My work falls somewhere here close to the Strong Story systems. As in, I uh, enable an experience manager to explore the space of all possible stories. But I also push those systems towards the strong autonomy in the way that I provide models for characters to, be more, uh, to act more believably. So in short, my research statement is that I propose models of personality and emotion for strong story narrative planning. And I hypothesize that using my models, we can generate more, more believable behavior and we can leverage the strong story nature of the system to generate conflicts more intelligently. <coughs> Excuse me. But why narrative planning? I chose narrative planning because of various reasons. First, it is the way it processes stories is very similar to how people tell stories. It breaks down a story into a sequence of actions. We basically, the narrative planning systems are inspired by the people and we can use the processes and algorithms to learn about how people tell stories and analyze stories. And the other reason is that the narrative planning acts like a white box. We basically can, uh, uh, can inspect and analyze its results and we can also uh, see the details and the processes of how we're getting those results. The main differences of uh, my work with previous models is that I focus on strong story, interactive multi-agent systems that are highly domain independent. And when I say domain independent, I mean that these systems rely a lot more on the systems uh, intelligent rather than a human author's intelligent. And domain independence can directly help us to make the systems more reusable. I also focus on risk, uh, reasoning and decision-making rather than physiological manifestations such as facial expressions or gestures. So the domain that I'm going to use throughout my presentation is like this. Tom uh, is sick and he needs medicine. He can buy the medicine using one of his coins from the merchant, but he also knows that there are some herbs in the forest that he could collect and make the medicine himself. But in actuality, there are no herbs in the forest. Now, this domain is kind of different from the video that I showed you, and I will discuss the video, video's domain in more detail later. The, Tom also knows that there is a bandit in the forest, and it is possible for the bandit to still, uh, steal his coins. So he also can think of a plan to go to the town and buy a sword from the merchant. And after buying the sword, he knows that the bandit could not drop him anymore. So first, I'm going to talk about narrative planning, the foundations that I basically build my models on. And then I'm going to propose the model of emotion and personality of how characters can express emotions and act based on their emotions. And then use that model to propose a model of personality that shows how characters might prioritize different, different emotions over the others and uh, demonstrate consistent behavior. And then I show the strength uh, strengths of my models of emotion and personality uh, in terms of uh, the ability of strong story systems to generate conflicts intelligently. So narrative planning. Previous models define nar uh, narrative planning problems using these components. First, there is an initial state, which is the complete description of the initial state of the world a set of characters and a utility function for each character, and each character wants to increase, take actions to increase the value of their utility function, and also a utility function for the author that basically every story has to uh, end in increasing the author's utility function. A utility function is presented in uh, terms of a sequence of rules. We process e uh, 
evaluate it, rules from top to bottom, checking the proposition on the left hand uh, side of the rule. And if we find a proposition that is true, we return the real number that is on the right side of the rule. If we don't find any proposition to be true, we just return zero. And we also, the author, uh, the author also provides a set of actions that uh, can be possible for characters to take to increase their utility function. So the actions that are defined by the author are in a template such as this, for example, for the action steal, uh, Tom stealing the medicine from the merchant is also a possibility. Uh, for an action to be possible, its preconditions have to be true. So Tom and the merchant have to be in the same place. The merchant has to have the medicine and Tom has to have the sword. And after taking a medicine, the effects of the, after uh, taking the action, the effects of the action dictates how the world state changes based on that action. So after stealing the medicine, the medicine is going to be, Tom is going to have the medicine. We also specify who is the consenting character of the action in which in this case, Tom, is the consenting, but the merchant is not because the mer we don't the merchant doesn't have to have a reason to get robbed, basically. So our research team introduced extended this model by introducing a model of belief. So far, the narrative planners basically expanded the space of all character plans that uh, were possible in classical planning, with a set of uh, plans that were we refer to them as intentionality. So basically in those plans, the characters only took actions that contributed to their goals. To that, we added the model of belief that now we could also reason about what character beliefs were. So for example, now we can reason about Tom believing that there are herbs in the forest, but there actually is not. And we, uh, we stated that the space, uh, the most believable space of plans is basically this uh, intersection between intentionality and beliefs. So those, uh, the definition uh, that we provided was that a plan is explained for a character if an action is explained for a character, if it is the first action of a sequence and that character believes that sequence uh, could increase their utility. And the character also believes that all actions in that sequence are explained for all their consenting characters. That sequence also has no strict subsequence that meets those criteria, which basically uh, accounts for the redundancy in the plans. So this is the, a part of the state space for the example domain that I mentioned. So here we can reason about what Tom believes by following the epistemic edge for Tom. We can say that Tom plans to go to the forest, collect the herbs and make the medicine. He also plans that he also could plan that he could go to the town and buy the medicine from the merchant. So now what I did for my thesis was, I also wanted to account for expected plans for character expectations. The, uh, different, the main difference between expected plans and uh, explained plans is that for a character to expect a plan, the character does not necessarily have to believe that that plan could increase their utility. So for example, we can say that Tom expects that if he goes to the forest, the bandit could drop him. And now you can see that we are actually reasoning about two or more layers of belief. So this plan is not explained for Tom because it doesn't increase his utility, but it is expected. Tom could still expect that the bandit could drop him and his utility would decrease as a result. Now, what is the point of this? If we keep track of the expected plans, we can also find plans that directly address those expected plans. So because Tom thinks that the bandit could drop him, he also thinks that he could go to the town and buy a sword. Now, this plan is not explained for Tom based on the current definitions because buying a sword doesn't increase Tom's utility. It actually decreases Tom's utility because he has to spend one of his coins. That is why I think I, we need to, uh, I needed to expand the space of all character plans with a new subset using emotions. Now, in the next section, I will discuss how I use the emotions to make such plans possible. 
So for my model of emotion, I uh, draw from the OCC theory of emotion, which is a well-known and validated model of emotion in psychology. It models 22 emotions and was later expanded to include 24 emotions. Uh, I, I don't want you to look at the, uh, the text in the tree structure here. I just wanted to show that it has a clean, finite tree structure. And uh, each emotion in that structure basically has a positive or a negative valence. So for example, surprise is not an emotion in this model because it, we don't really know if it has a positive or neg a negative uh, valence. It might be positive sometimes, it might be negative sometimes. And the terminology, that the OCC provides is kind of similar to the uh, terminology available in, in narrative planning, specifically in the area that uh, I've specified with the red border. And I've chosen to uh, adapt these emotions in my model for now. It is always, always uh, possible to extend it to include other emotions, mainly because uh, first, the terminology in those emotions are, as I said, exist in narrative planning, but in other ones, the other ones, for example, they talk about character standards and social conventions. And those things, uh, second, those things are not universal to every story domain. So now I talk about the specifics of the emotions and how they're triggered in narrative planning. So if a character's utility increases, they feel joy. And if their utility decreases, they feel distress. So if Tom goes to the town and buys the medicine, he feels joy. But if he goes to the forest and gets robbed by the bandit, he feels distress. We can also reason about character expectations using the model of belief. So if a character expects that their utility could increase, they feel hope. And if they expect that their utility could decrease, they feel fear. So they expect that they could go to the forest and collect the herbs and make the medicine. So they feel hope for this plan. They also expect that they could go to the forest and the bandit could rob him. So they fear that expected plan. Now, if a, a hoped utility is achieved by a character, they feel satisfaction. And if a feared utility is achieved, they feel fears confirmed. So since they were hoping that they could go to the town and buy the medicine, when it happens, they feel satisfaction. And since they were fearing that they could go to the forest and get robbed by the bandits, and when it happens, they feel fears confirmed. But if it actually doesn't happen, if they no longer expect the feared utility, of, they feel relief. And if they no longer expect the hoped utility, they feel disappointment. So now this is the part that we can use to make these plans possible. Tom can think of a plan that in which he goes to the town and buys the sword, and doing, in doing so, he no longer expects that he could get robbed by the bandit. So he feels relief as a result of this plan. He also hopes to go to the forest and collects the herbs, but when he goes to the forest in actuality, he sees that there are no herbs there. So he feels disappointment. There are also four emotions based on the co different combination of how the utility of two characters changes. So for example, if Tom goes to the town and buys the medicine, the utility of both Tom and the merchant increases, so they both feel happy for each other. And if Tom goes to the forest and gets robbed by the bandit, Tom's utility decreases, but the bandit's utility increases. So Tom feels resentment towards the bandit, but the bandit feels gloating towards Tom. And of course, there are no uh, examples in this domain about pity, but pity triggers when the utility of two characters decreases as a result of the same action. So now that I've defined the emotions, I can change the definition of an explained plan as follows. I can, I want to change the this criteria which uh, dictates that a character should believe that a sequence of actions could increase their utility. And instead, I want to say that a character believes that a sequence of actions could trigger a positive emotion for them. So that emotion could be joy, satisfaction, relief, happy for, and gloating. Using this definition, a plan like this becomes possible because before this plan was not allowed because it doesn't increase uh, Tom's utility, but now it is because it makes Tom feel relief. So as a result of that, I'm basically expanding the space of possible character plans using emotions. So that plan of buying a sword basically falls somewhere around here. 
because it doesn't increase a character's utility. It actually decreases it, but they it makes them feel relief. And the space of uh, emotional character plans is a superset of the intentional plans because basically, if a, a character's uh, a character feels hope for a plan or joy uh, for a plan, it falls in the intentionality section. But for other positive emotions such as happy for gloating or relief it falls outside the intentionality because it doesn't necessarily increase their utility. And now I say that the most uh, believable behavior falls in this intersection of the Venn diagram. Excuse me. So to evaluate my model of emotion, I conducted several human subject studies Using Amazon's Mechanical Turk, I recruited workers from AMT. I didn't target any specific population. Every AMT worker had an equal opportunity to accept the assignment and be compensated for accepting it and completing it. And I implemented the interactive narratives using Twine. So it's, the output was basically an HTML web page that the participants viewed. So in the first experiment, I wanted to validate the six basic emotions uh, and check whether the, the way my, mo uh, my system models emotion, those emotions is similar to how a human audience expects those emotions to be triggered. So for that, I uh, presented the description of a domain to the participants. And then after specific sets of steps, I asked the participants what they think the character feels at that, at that moment. And they could choose between these six different emotions. So I collected the results from 70 participants for seven total questions. I calculated the p-value using binomial exact te uh, test for each option of each question. And for the option that the p-value was smaller than 0 0.05, uh, I chose that option as the correct option, as the, the majority of the part or significant number of participants agreed on that option. And then I compared that option to what my model says the character feels and calculated accuracy. Now the accuracy was 100%, but for two questions, the participants significantly agreed on two options. So one of them was when, a character, when Tom spends a coin to buy a sword, participants said that, agreed that he feels relief and distress because he's uh, spending a coin, but he's no longer being robbed. And when he reaches home with the medicine participants said agreed that Tom feels joy for reaching home and relief that he wasn't robbed anymore. For the second experiment, I wanted to investigate, investigate whether expression of emotion makes characters more, more believable in an interactive story and whether that those expressions caused empathy in the player. This experiment also enabled me to investigate whether uh, human players would choose to uh, execute plans that would make them feel relief or happy for. And that would kind of validate the way that uh, my model de uh, determines what plans are valid. So in that scenario, the player played an interactive game in which they played the role of Tom and they interacted with two virtual characters, John and William. Only one of the characters expressed their emotions uh, via their facial expressions and uh, emotion keywords, such as hope or fear. And the emotional character and uh, whether they were on the left or the right was randomized. So again, I calculated the p-value and the following results, uh, results were significant because their, the p-value was smaller than 0.05. The players chose to buy a sword, which shows that human players choose to uh, take actions that would make them feel relief, even though they, they needed to spend one of their coins. The, the players also chose to help the character help a character by giving them a coin or a sword, again, to validate stories in which characters take actions to feel happy for. And the players chose to help the emotional character more significantly. It shows that the expression of emotion basically caused empathy in the player. Also, the players found that the, after the story was finished, I asked the participants to choose from the two characters uh, based on several questions. 
and the players, based on those results, the players found the emotional characters more believable. So now that I've defined a set of emotions and enable characters to express those emotions or act based on those emotions, I can define a model of personality which dictates how characters prioritize between different between feeling different emotions and uh, demonstrate consistent behavior throughout the story. So for personality, in short, the way my model of personality works is that I define a set of personality features and then a character distinguishes between different plans based on those personality features. And I'm going to uh, talk about those features in the next slides. So for the model of personality, I draw from the big five or the five factor model, which defines four core categories of uh, personality traits. And it basically uh, is a result of clustering and correlation al analysis of a huge amount of adjectives. So basically any adjective that you would use to describe a character falls under one of these uh, main factors. So individuals with high op openness are adventurous, creative, unconventional, and intellectual. For the personality features, uh, for to model creativity, they, uh, they try to maximize their utility which is uh, drawn from the definition of creativity with characters trying to find, trying to explore the space of concepts and find the highest quality concept in, in this context. The uh, space of con uh, concepts is basically the space of all plans and the highest quality co concept is the plan with the highest utility. So, <clears throat> so if we uh, write the utility function in, way, in a way that Tom can uh, make the medicine by keeping his coins, a creative agent would choose to do so to maximize their utility. For intellect, <coughs> excuse me. For intellect, the characters would choose the plan that has the highest probability of success or basically the lowest probability of failure which is calculated by the intensity of their fears that basically the possibility that the, that the plan could fail. So in that case, a high open Tom would not go to the forest because he could get robbed by the bandits and his plan could fail. Uh, individuals with high conscientiousness are efficient, organized and industrious. To model efficiency, the characters basically choose the shortest plan, just go to town, buy the medicine. They are also choose self uh, to be self efficacious, so they try to maximize the number of actions uh, where they are the consenting character of that action. So basically, for example, Tom wouldn't wait for the merchant to come to him to sell him this uh, medicine if he was highly uh, conscientious. For extroversion, characters are sociable, assertive, and uh, enthusiastic. So in short, they want to involve as many other characters as possible into their own plans, uh, either with their consent to uh, demonstrate sociable, uh, being sociable or to without their consent to demonstrate being assertive. So for example, just going to the town and buy the medicine from the merchant is an extroverted action, extroverted plan, or to show assertiveness, Tom, for example, if possible, would tell the merchant that there are some herbs in the forest and the merchant could go collect them to make the medicine. Individuals with high agree agreeableness are compassionate and uh, cooperative. For compassion, they basically want to maximize their happy for, uh, the intensity of happy for feeling. So not only Tom would buy the medicine, he, all, he would also buy the sword to make the merchant happy. For politeness, they want to minimize the intensity of their gloating. So Tom would never try to steal the medicine from the merchant. And finally, individuals with high neuroticism are anxious, they're impulsive and self-doubting. So they try to maximize their intensity of their relief so they could eliminate their stress and anxiety. So Tom would just go straight to the town to buy the sword. And they are self-doubting, so they keep changing their mind. Tom, for example, could go to the forest, uh, collect the medicine, but then change his mind, go to the town to buy the medicine, and so on. So now that we have 12 features, when we want to decide about the personality of a character, we calculate the value of each feature for every possible plan. And 
and, and then normalize those values into zero and one and multiply them by the personality value of each factor that is defined by the author. Uh, we calculate the Euclidean norm and eventually we basically get a value, a number that shows the preference of the character for a plan. So the characters could choose the plan with the highest uh, preference. To evaluate the model of personality, I wanted to first uh, evaluate whether the if I used my model to generate a story, the human audience would perceive the personality traits used in those stories. And uh, then I would want, also want to check whether they could recognize similar stories that show similar kind of personality traits uh, for the main character. So for this experiment, for each participant, I basically randomly chose a condition for the that condition was what factor of the main character is high or low so for example imagine that for a participant it is decided that their openness is high then i would show so uh, four short stories that were uh, generated using four different plans one plan that showed high openness one plan that showed low openness one plan that showed neutral Hmm. Openness. And I'm I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you all? I'm I'm getting some lag on my end. I can't tell if that's me or everyone. Or yeah, it's good for me too. Good for me. Okay, so you all are okay. Yes. Okay, I, I think I'm just. It must be just on my end then. But everything seems to be be back now. Sorry to interrupt. So after I uh, showed the participant, this is the plan that the character chose. I asked them some five point Likert questions, which basically asked them to choose between the five point Likert options about the markers for that condition. So for, for example, for uh, uh, openness or conscientiousness, I selected a bunch of markers based on the personality in inventories uh, in psychology papers. And then, so these are, for example, some of the markers and I asked them. And after that, I would show them again, four different stories with the same kind of criteria with high openness, low openness, uh, the shortest possible plan and a random plan. And then ask them, now that I've shown you the, what kind of plan ta uh, the main character chooses, this was actually a different domain than the that domain that I'm, I've been using in the presentation. Uh, I asked them to choose the plan that that character would basically decide to execute. So based on that, uh, the results were mostly significant except for openness and neuroticism, which were marginally significant, meaning that the p-value was smaller than 0.1 rather than 0 0.05, which might be uh, attributed to the way I'm asking the, mar the markers that I selected to ask the participants about the, their perception. So now in the next experiment, I combined personality and emotion in, to generate stories at the same time. And then the way it worked was uh, I generated stories in which either the emotion was turned on or off and the same thing for personality. And when I say turned on or off, it means that for emotion, whether the character expressed their emotion through, uh, through keywords such as hope or fear, and for personality, uh, the, each story consisted of two different acts, uh, two main acts. And if the character's personality was consistent over consistent over the two acts, I would say that that story represents personality. So basically, each in each story, we could say that uh, our independent variable existence of personality or emotion is it turned on or is it turned off? And it was possible for a story for both of them to be turned off. And based on that, each of the story was basically a point in this Venn diagram with the either the, with the existence of personality or emotion or none of them. So after each story, I asked participants uh, five point Likert questions again. So for this question, the story provides good descriptions of Tom's internal thoughts. And I used cumulative link model 
I actually consulted a statistician for, to evaluate the results of the, uh, this experiment and they suggested to use this test. And for this question, it was shown that if the emotion was turned on, the results were significantly the, better than if both of the features were turned off or only personality was turned on. And the interesting thing was that if for the stories that both personality and emotion were turned on, the results, the effects were not significantly better than if the only the emotion was turned on. So basically uh, for this question and the next question, uh, the existence of personality and emotion had an additive effect, but having both of them was not significantly different from the added effect of either, either of them independently. So again, for the question, Tom's actions in act two were consistent to his actions in act uh, one. I said them opposite way. So if personality was turned on, the results for these questions were significant for if they were both turned off or the emotion only was turned on. And again, as, as I said, the, the results for turning them both on weren't significantly better than only turning personality on. For these two questions, the results weren't significant. I, I think it's because of the wording of these two questions, specifically like realistic, lifelike character might be uh, expecting kind of too much for the current state of the model for the audience to say that this character is behaving realistic and lifelike. And for the unique and the personality, and this one is really interesting because the participants are actually perceiving personality traits. They're saying the actions are consistent over the two acts. But when directly we ask them about personality, they say that they didn't notice uh, personality. This could, there's also friend significant. So it, either the unique part here is causing a problem or the asking directly about the personality. After that, uh, I basically showed two stories to each participant. And then uh, after showing both of them, I asked them to choose between uh, the two stories based on these questions. And the results were mostly significant. Again, the same thing happened uh, applied here. For this one, I, uh, we used logical regression to analyze the result. And again, the, the same thing applies. Have, adding both of them didn't have a significantly better effect than uh, having either of them independently, except for one question. Now that I've talked about emotion and personality, I can leverage the, those models as well as their strong story nature and showcase one example of, of how we could use those uh, strengths in uh, generating conflicts intelligently. So conflict is an, is an important essential part of every story. Conflicts put the players in a uh, in situations where they have to stop and make a decision and they usually their plans are threatened by the plans of other characters so previous models of uh, conflict uh, an example of that is sepulchral which defined a conflict as when only one of the two plans is possible to be completed and one of them would be thwarting the other but what the previous models did not do was to distinguish between different types of conflicts, different situations where conflict happened. And um, they also did not use that intelligently. They just uh, recognized it and generated them in a story. So my model of uh, conflict, we can use the emotion and personality to basically define a conflict using simple terms. The conflict exists when a character fears the plan of another character and a conflict is resolved when that fear turns either into relief or into fears confirmed so before i actually give some examples about the conflict uh, i must distinguish between uh, explicit encouragement and in implicit encouragement i'm basically using a conflict to encourage certain type of behavior in the player so for I define explicit encouragement as the player shows a certain type of behavior and then the system shows them verbal or symbolic affirmations saying like well done or high score or uh, so on and basically explicitly encouraging them to show that uh, to repeat uh, demonstrating that kind of behavior uh, a different kind of encouragement is implicit encouragement which i'm actually going to show 
how I'm using implicit encouragement that happens before the player has actually demonstrated that kind of behavior. So imagine this example that as soon as Tom goes to the forest, a bandit approaches them. So let's assume that before this action happened, uh, the player did not actually know that there was a bandit and did not know about the threat. So this action is basically presenting a conflict to the player. Now the, that the player, excuse me. Now that the, uh, the player is actually afraid that they could get robbed. So they, have, they may have multiple options. Let's imagine one option is to attack the bandit so that they wouldn't get robbed. Or they could just talk to the bandit and try to persuade them not to rob them. And also, uh, it is also possible for the player not to do anything and just get uh, robbed by the bandit. So in this situation, let's, uh, in this situation, we're actually, uh, the system is making sure that the player always has a certain type of uh, option to resolve a conflict. So imagine that the, the author of the system wants to encourage agreeableness in the player so that they want the player to demonstrate agreeable behavior. In this option, this conflict is kind of okay because the player has the option to talk to the bandits and try to resolve the conflict. But if, if assuming in because of any reason that option wasn't available to the player and the only option that the player had was to attack the bandits, the system would kind of consider this as a problem because this in this situation the player does not have the opportunity to demonstrate the behavior that is intended by the author uh, in this case agreeableness so the system would not allow this conflict to occur in the first place the the bandit would never approach tom in the first place and this is how i define implicit encouragement the system basically looks ahead and tries to find conflicts, tries to find opportunities for the conflicts and explores the, all the player options that are available to resolve the conflict and then check the, all of those options, whether they match the, uh, the behavior that is intended by the author. And if the player is not able to resolve the conflict using the behavior intended by the author, it marks the conflict as invalid Otherwise, it marks it as valid. So the player can resolve the conflict using intended behavior. So this way, we are kind of implicitly encouraging the player to show certain type of, type of behavior that is intended by the author. So in order to evaluate that, we, I basically go back to the video to show you again. Let me again share the audio. So in this situation, Tom wants to collect the herbs in the forest. As soon as he goes to the forest, the system now has one option. The system recognizes that there was a there there can be a conflict here, whether the bandit shows up or doesn't show up. If the bandit shows up, the player is uh, presented with the conflict, and they would consider their options. Now the system, pre, uh, when generating the story, considered the player options, and one option for the player is to go to the town and buy the sword, which is considered an agreeable option because the player doesn't actually attack the bandit. The, the bandit just goes away. He wouldn't rob, uh, try to rob Tom. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in this case, the system basically says this conflict is okay. Uh, it, assuming that the author's intended behavior is basically agreeableness. So the bandit shows up. And the player chooses to resolve the conflict by going to the merchant and buying a sword. And then proceeds to go collect the herbs and try to brew them. So now again, there is another opportunity for conflict. When the player tries to brew the medicine, should the merchant get angry or not? If the merchant gets angry, the player basically has no other option but to either get attacked by the merchant or attack the merchant themselves. 
So in this case, this conflict is not okay if the author's interpretation is agreeableness because Tom, the player is forced to show the island. So instead, imagine another world in which the merchant doesn't get angry and the player can continue to brew the medicine. So for this domain, I generated all the possible stories. In total, it was about uh, 43,291 stories. A hundred of those stories, the player agent chose to uh, take actions uh, intentionally, uh, intelligently. So they, they only took actions that were explained. And there were also stories in which the player agent chose to act randomly. So it was possible for a story to, for the player to just kill themselves. So uh, among those only a hundred of stories, the agent acted uh, intelligently. Among all of those stories, over 26,000 of them demonstrated intelligent conflict generation, meaning that if a conflict was presented to the player, the player always had the option to resolve it using the behavior intended by the author. Excuse me. And in those, uh, in overall, in this generated stories, about 71 about 72% of the time, the conflicts were good conflicts, as in the player had the option to resolve the conflict using intended behavior. So if we didn't do any intelligent conflict generation, on average, it was possible for the player to be forced to resolve a conflict to using uh, unintended behavior 30% of, uh, about 30% of the time. Alex, I think, hold on, think, hold on, back one slide. I think those numbers might be switched. Is, is it bad no. 71% and good 28%? No, that, that's correct. So it, it, it's like, so on average, if you generate, a, when you're generating a story, on average, it is possible that 30% of the time, a bad conflict is presented to the player. So we want to actually decrease that number as much as possible to decrease it even to zero with intelligent conflict generation. Another thing to consider was the good resolution, which means that basically the player agent chose to resolve a conflict using the intended uh, behavior. If we didn't do any intelligent conflict generation, the player agent resolved the conflict in a good way, 46% of the time. But if we used intelligent conflict generation, on average, the player agent showed uh, the good resolution 56%. The other application uh, for in the context of a training simulation, I integrated my models into our virtual reality project, uh, Traffic Stop, which is, uh, again, something for uh, training police officers how and when to use force and basically simulates a traffic stop where a police officer has stopped a car because they were speeding. They check the license plate, and they, when they run the plate, they realize that there is a restraining order for the the driver has filed a restraining order. So they go to the passenger and ask for their driver's license to see if whether that person is the one that is mentioned in the restraining order. Now it is possible for the passenger to just draw their gun and basically present a conflict to the player and at that moment the police officer has no choice but to shoot the suspect because they've drawn their gun and the next action they're going to take is basically either try to shoot the driver or the police officer so in this situation this is not really a good conflict to present to the player there's no other option but to shoot them but imagine a different kind of scenario Instead of the passenger drawing their gun, imagine they're expressing their anger. And in this project it is in the early stages of development. So this animation is basically trying to express anger. 
Now, in that situation, the police officer has the option to explain the situation to the passenger and resolve the conflict using agreeable behavior. So they get the uh, driver's license. Uh, th th that's a good question. In this simulation, we assume that they are, when shooting, they are only going to shoot the passenger. It won't actually harm the driver. Now, it, again, as I said, it's in the early stages of development. So I think in the actual simulation, the passenger would leave the car and draw their gun. So it is safer for the police officer to shoot in the direction of them. Uh, did it pause? OK. So they got the driver's license, and they check, yes, that belongs to the restraining order. And they ask them to leave the car and handcuff the passenger. So in this case, for about 400,000 stories were generated. This time, over 12,000 of them uh, demonstrated intelligent player agent behavior, which the actions were explained. Among them, uh, about 181,000 of the stories demonstrated intelligent conflict generation, again, meaning that when a conflict was presented to the player, they always had the option to resolve it using the author's intended behavior. And in this case, the bad conflicts was actually 70%. So in this case, bad conflicts were, the percentage of them was a, a lot more than good conflicts. So we were on average, we were expecting to see a bad conflict more, uh, more than we would expect to see a good one. Overall, the player agent on average showed good resolution in 35% per, uh, of the time. But if we applied intelligent conflict generation, which means that we basically created more opportunities for the player agent to show good resolutions, they had the option to do so. And they did on average 67% of the time. So in, uh, in summary, basically using intelligent conflict generation, we are going to generate fewer conflicts because we're not going to allow bad conflicts. So we're reducing their the bad conflicts to zero. And on average, we're going to create more opp opportunities for the player to demonstrate the uh, intended behavior. So on average, we're increasing the number of good resolutions. So in conclusion, I'm proposing models of personality and emotion for strong story models uh, that use uh, and present possibilities to reason about character expectations and try to anticipate what a character will do. And the thing about them is that we can apply them in an interactive context to the player to, uh, to model what the, a player is expecting to happen and anticipate, uh, anticipate what the player is going to do. And it also ensures that the <clears throat> behavior of the agents is consistent over throughout the story, uh, throughout the story, which can result in more believable behavior. Using the strong story nature of the system, uh, an example of using that is to generate conflicts intelligently. There are there are various ways that we can uh, showcase why. Uh, the strong story nature of the models is useful. And these possibilities can also help us in designing an authoring tool for, uh, to present uh, to the author when they're des uh, um, designing a story about the characters, expectations, uh, uh, anticipations, plans, and their personality. In the future, I hope to expand and improve the model. I hope to adapt other emotions of the OCC which I uh, excluded in this work. I, I also plan to include disappointment as a conflict. So right now conflict is defined if a player is expecting, uh, is pl the player is fearing that their utility could decrease, but we could also in uh, include disappointment. So like if the player expects uh, the bandit to kill the merchant, they wouldn't fear this utility, because uh, they, they wouldn't fear this plan because their utility wouldn't decrease. But as a, result of the, as a result of this, they would feel disappointment. So it kind of makes sense for them to uh, proactively, proactively react to the situation as well. 
Uh, we can also include uh, explicit encouragement in the, uh, enable the system to do explicit encouragement by finding plans that would make the player feel satisfaction or fears confirmed based on the uh, based on the behavior that they demonstrated when resolving a conflict so for example if a, a hand authored way to do this in the police use of force study is when they shoot the passenger they basically get a lower score so we would uh, an automated system would automate this process to find uh, plans that would like show the high score to the police officer if, if they showed the intended behavior uh, I also generated stories for small domains, uh, for sm small domains. So it is uh, worthy of investigating for larger domains to find efficient algorithms that try to do the same thing to generate the stories. I also plan to see if I could uh, replicate the results using machine learning, deep learning, reinforcement learning algorithms, and uh, com at least compare the results to see how they work and then to see if I could use those algorithms to in, uh, implement my models of emotion and personality. Thank you so much. That concludes my presentation. Great. Uh, thank you, Alex. I have a handful of questions prepared, but I would love uh, to hear from the committee first. So, um, Committee, please take it away. And if there are no immediate questions, then I will jump in with a few. Should I keep sharing my screen? Um, I guess it would depend on if people ask to go back to the specific slide. slide. Oh, and turn off your um, audio sharing because that might yes. create an, an echo. I just did. I have a question. Uh, on the, the case with the police officer training, uh, you show two options, one where the passenger pulls a gun and one where the passenger doesn't. It wasn't clear to me what the player did differently in those two cases. Why did one player get the gun drawn and one player just got an angry passenger? Well, that's actually the process of intelligent conflict generation. As I mentioned, it's implicit encouragement. So it basically reasons about this uh, the conflicts or plans conflict ahead of time. So it basically it doesn't, uh, the player's actions doesn't matter. The system, if it intelligently generates conflicts, it, it looks ahead and sees that if, if the passenger draws their gun, these are the options available to the player. And if we do that, uh, we look at, we want to do implicit encouragement. We're like, if they draw their gun, the player only has the option to shoot the passenger. So the system would not do this in the first place. So it, to answer your question, it doesn't depend on the user's actions, but on the system's uh, intelligence. So is it just randomly generated as to whether or not a new player is going to encounter the case where the gun comes out? Well, it the the goal is that this process is not random anymore it is intelligent so basically in this situation if the passenger draws their gun the player the the player's only option is to shoot the passenger so that conflict never happens basically i only showed that in the video to show that this is considered a bad conflict Okay, so go ahead. Uh, uh, um, <clears throat> I get. I guess my first question would be: um, There are a bunch of people who would look at this and say this is superficially similar to Emma. Um, uh, Vadim Blitko, for example takes Emma to be any system in which you have goals in a plan-based system driving emotion. Uh, Emma was developed for a um, intelligent training system, um, which is not exactly the same as story generation. On the other hand, you're using story generation for developing, developing an intelligent training system. 
So how would you compare and contrast this with Emma? Uh, so just to be clear that this model, these models could be applied to weather training or educational simulations, such as the police use of force, but it could also be applied to the entertainment context, which I showed with our Camelot uh, video. But to answer your question, uh, from what I know about Emma and their implementation, it is strong story, strong autonomy rather than strong story, which basically with if we go the strong story route, we basically have access to the, to explore and plan ahead for uh, the space of all possible stories, which I, I try to showcase the, the possibilities that it provides us with the intelligent conflict generation. I believe that the uh, Emma it goes towards the strong autonomy. So they are basically, they don't have that centralized unit of intelligence, or if they do, they do, they're not exploring the space of all possible stories to try to plan a narrative. Um, so Emma, as I understand, so MRE, which is the overall system that, so Emma is just the emotion system. So in some sense, it's a category error to say Emma isn't strong story, this is strong story, because Emma really is just the emotion system. Um, but MRE, the training system in which it is or was embedded, um, was definitely not, to the best of my knowledge, based on a story planner, although it wasn't strong autonomy either, because there was a lot of, I mean, it was following a story. Um, but still, how would you compare and contrast the, um, you know, Emma as an emotion system to what you have? So the, the way I'm basically, my model is saying that this emotion is triggered based on this. This, I, I think it falls back to Jonathan uh, Gratch's emotional modeling paper, which I don't remember the year, but it was a while back, which- That's talks, Emma, Gratch that's and Marcella. The, yeah. That's what turned into Emma. Okay, so better for the point of my, the point I'm trying to make. So I certainly draw drew from those ideas of this is how the, this emotion is triggered. This is how that emotion is triggered. And then I apply those concepts into basically strong story uh, narrative generation. So I'm saying like, now uh, I can expand the previous narrative planners to allow characters to basically act on their relief. Now that I can use the, these uh, definitions of emotions to allow, enable characters to demonstrate their personality based on the, how they prioritize emotions. And now I can use those concepts uh, because I'm implementing those concepts in strong story. Now I can do things such as intelligent conflict generation. Okay. Nathan, did you have a question? Um, I did. I, I lost. I lost track of what it was. Um, trying to think about the last discussion. Um, I mean, I, I guess you know, I've got a few notes here. So, one of the things you mentioned, Alex, was the computational complexity. Um, like what? And you know, I don't know enough about the the details of the implementation of this to to really understand where that, you know, what the what the key issues are. Is this sort of, you know, exponential scaling as you have more options or as you have more characters or, you know, when, when things can be stochastic, can you just talk a little bit about the computational complexity issues and where, and where you think that there's, you know, I guess uh, where the limits are of what you've done and maybe where there are opportunities going forward? Of course. So uh, I'm going to give the example of, for example, Ed, the character fears a plan. In order to find the, the plans that the character fears, 
we're basically expanding the space and we're like, okay, we found this plane that the character fears. Let's look for plans that the characters can feel relief. So it basically depends on how much we're expand we're choosing to expand the space. So theoretically, we're expanding the entire story space, finding all the possible plans that the character fears or can help them feel relief. But again, computationally, that is just uh, not possible usually if unless the domain story domain is really small. So basically, it, like the way I implemented this for the uh, small domains, I'm saying I'm limiting the, the amount that I'm expanding the space. I'm saying like generate stories with 10 steps maximum or visit the store state space with this amount of depth. So the more we expand the space, the better our reasoning becomes. But then again, it's like, it's our decision how much to expand the space. And I guess that's where the computational part comes in. Okay, so it's, it basically limits the, the depth at which you can can plan a story. And is that something you would deal with in a hierarchical way? Or is there something else that you would deal with if you wanted to be able to you know, expand that to address larger, longer stories? So the way I'm, I implemented this was like the simple way of a breadth first search to just expand the space. Uh, and I limited how much I would expand it. Uh, I, I would need to run this, for example, to generate the 400,000 stories and it would take hours. Uh, but if I use the more efficient algorithm, if I found uh, other algorithms that would be computationally more uh, efficient, then I would be that those algorithms would basically let me expand the space more to try to uh, improve the quality of the systems reasoning so it's like it is a decision that depends on the algorithm of how much to expand the system the the more efficient the algorithm the more it lets us to expand it to be computationally feasible and is there work out there demonstrating the feasibility of such algorithms I think the one that comes to mind is Dr. Ware's Glaive, which uh, proposed an algorithm that would, uh, an efficient algorithm that would uh, help us uh, improve the computational complexity of generating things. But then again, it, Glaive did not have belief, did not have emotion, and did not have personality. Now, I think Rachel's work is kind of addressing the belief part. Uh, I'm not 100% sure how, how uh, advanced she got in designing algorithms, but I guess my step would be to add emotion, to investigate whether I could uh, reason about emotion and personality using such an algorithm as well. Okay. Um... And then I, I guess I had another thing, and I, I think you've addressed this to some extent, but you set up this dichotomy at the beginning of strong story and strong autonomy. And I, maybe you can just explain it again, because I, like I, I found myself feeling like it wasn't really like there were two ends of something. It was more like strong story could is just sort of a layer on top where there's, you know, you could have a lot of the same elements that that you see in in the strong autonomy case, you're just throwing some other goals and intentions on top of that. Um, and so maybe can you just talk a little bit about that again? So, Okay, sure. Uh, so I, I would talk about the extremes of the it, spectrum. It might help to back up to that slide. Okay. So, at the extreme of the spectrum in here, for example, for a strong autonomy, it's, I think tailspin is a good example. It's that every character is completely independent and autonomous and just makes decisions about what they, uh, what about their actions. Uh, 
So like a problem that would happen in the, uh, that happened in that uh, system was that a character would start to think about what they believe another character would do and what they believe the other character would believe that they would do. And this thinking would go infinitely. And basically that agent would just hang because they didn't know what to do. They just kept reasoning. So like that's that's something that could happen on that extreme. On the other extreme is uh, the author system in which the, uh, we we have a clear set of author goals and the system just tries to satisfy those goals. And the character might just uh, out of nowhere just kill themselves. A the character might do something that doesn't make any sense because that contributes to the author's goal. So let me, let me, let me like make it maybe a little more clear like when I was imagining that, you know, in the, the strong story, the, the whatever's controlled the story, what, what's the, the title? The of the experience name? manager. Experience manager, thank you. Like essentially is internally simulating what characters are going to be doing in some sense, right? Like that's what these, these plans are. And so it seems like, you know, even, even the, places where you where you model those things as being somewhat independent this sort of like free will like it's essentially much the same and so maybe this is where you know i don't have a good sense of what the actual computational bits are to really draw the distinction but it it, it feels like you know there's lots of different ways to simulate the characters and what they're doing and then there's authors the the story experience manager has goals right and so you that's why I was feeling like it's more of a layering as opposed to two ends of the spectrum. So I, I think I, what you're referring to is, I, I mentioned these are two extremes, but systems usually go towards either one of them. So it's like systems are moving on the spectrum. So it we kind of can talk about how much independence a character has or how much control the experience manager has. And I think that's that kind of uh, is what you're thinking about. But I also want to go back to the example of improv versus puppet shows. I think it my work is more like a puppet show. It's like the experience manager is controlling every interaction. So to an audience, the characters only appear to have personality, appear to have goals, but they have no control over their decision. The experience manager is basically reasoning about all of that. So it's, it, I'm basically pushing the strong story side kind of towards their strong autonomy. I'm, I'm thinking about character believability, but I'm also not giving them the, the freedom to do anything they want. So I think you're kind of expressing the idea accurately, I would say. Yeah, so I, I think that maybe it's just a, I think you're talking about it more from a outside the systems perspective. And I think I was probably thinking about it more from an inside of the systems perspective. I think that might be the, the distinction, but I'm, I'm happy to, to yield the floor and let other questions come through. So thank you. Can I just uh, play off of that though and ask a follow-up, which is there are systems out there um, like Versu, which are strong story, not in the specific sense that there is a generative planner that is planning a story, but in the sense that there is an authored nonlinear story um, that has general authorial goals that is being sort of improvisationally um, uh, put on. Um, so versus like that, um, facade is like that. But within that, the individual characters are running their own planners. Um, can you, how, how would you talk about the advantages and disadvantages of your system relative to those? 
Like it's, it, I, I agree that like the Sims is, and, and Dwarf Fortress are not going to, generally speaking, generate things that, that look like satisfying story arcs. Um, but, you know, what about the systems that, that have like handcrafted story arcs in them or, or a few different ones? I think the, the strength of the, my system is in the way that we can explore the space of all possible stories and try to plan different branches, trying, uh, trying to plan the user experience or the narrative. And I try to show that, show that using the, the way I generated conflicts. So it's like, I, I, again, I think the example that you mentioned with the, the experience manager being there, but also allowing characters to kind of improv with their actions. In that situation, it is quite possible for a conflict to happen that the player is forced to uh, demonstrate that his behavior, demonstrate behavior that is not intended by the author. We can't 100% ensure that. But using a system that is closer to what I'm doing, we basically have, we're, we're basically exploring that space and we're ensuring that the author wants that to do this and they, want, they don't want such a conflict to happen. Can we 100% sure it or not? I'm, that's, that's a, a pretty categorical claim. Um, I don't know that it's false, but I don't know that it's true either. And I, th I think it's, it's, it's hard to, I, I mean, I, I absolutely see the argument that it is desirable to have a planner that, um, you know, can generate conflict and so on. Um, but I'm not sure that it's accurate to say that those other platforms end up having un authorially undesired conflicts because the the characters are crafted so as to sort of do the things they're supposed to do within the story, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, what would be an example from Facade, for example, where um, there ends up being a conflict for the player that was not intended by Michael and Andrew? So I don't have the narrative of facade specifically in mind to give you an example, but I wanted to emphasize when I say like 100%, I'm saying theoret theoretically 100%. It's, it's not going to be 100% because again, it, we're theoretically imagining that we're expanding the entire space, but we can't actually do that. What, we, what we're doing is we're saying we're, it's more likely or, if, or it's the most likely thing to happen. And to the thing that you just mentioned, you're ba yeah, I'm, I'm not saying that those systems would generate events that would be undesirable by, by the author, but I, I am saying that they are more likely to do so. And there are measures that we could take in order to decrease that likelihood. So if you say that in facade, we are limiting or subduing the characters not to do the the bad conflict for example we're kind of doing the same thing that my system is doing so we're kind of going down and up that spectrum so we, we kind of want to be clear about what we're doing and what we're not doing could you comment on uh, automatic experience management versus manual um, I don't know if manual is quite the right word for it, but uh, it, human. Right. Human experience. experience management. Yeah. Yeah. So the difference between generating the story automatically and hand authoring a story. Is that hand authoring the experience management. So in those kinds of systems, usually, you know, they're, they're kind of branching stories. 
is, is usually what gets generated. There are a few like different possible outcomes that uh, get authored for. And so then the author is, you know, sort of keeping in mind um, ways of hurting you toward one or the other. And that, that just ends up being part of the authorial process usually. The way I think about it, I think it falls on the uh, on another spectrum between domain independence and domain dependence. So it's like, how much are you relying on the author's intelligence rather than the system's intelligence? And I'm trying to move towards the system intelligence. I'm, I'm still relying on the authors giving me information, giving me the actions, the, the personality, the states, uh, the initial state, uh, and the character goals, etc. So I'm I'm kind of relying on them on providing information, but I'm trying to reduce that information as much as possible. So it is it depends on what you're trying to do. If you if you want to handcraft the 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 stories a lot more, you're kind of moving down the domain dependence spectrum. So you're kind of sacrificing your reusability, I think. I, I, now, I don't know if that kind of answers your question or not. Okay, thank you. Uh, Brent, Tom? I just uh, had one. Uh, yeah, go. You can go ahead, Tom. I just had one little thing in that. So you included both emotion and personality, but a lot of emotion can be uh, included within personality. So neuroticism involves, as you actually talked about, anxiousness. And it also includes depressiveness and anger and shame. Um, and joy is more an area of positive emotionality within an extroversion. Um, I just wondered, was, was it ever possible for there to be a conflict between the emotion and the personality with any of this in, in any of the scenarios? I don't, I don't think there was, but I just wondered if that was ever an issue for you. So it, I, I'm trying to see if I understand your question. So for example, I determined one of the features of agreeableness was that they want to maximize their happy for, for example. And it is possible for a character not to find any plans that helps other characters. It, let, let's say like the character can't even find any plan that wouldn't hurt other characters. So they are agreeable, but the author hasn't provided enough opportunities for the agreeable character to actually demonstrate their agreeableness. So basically, the system's quality is only as good as the, the author allows it to be. So if the author just limits the, the actions all to be like violent, an agreeable character ends up in doing violent things. Th okay. Does that kind of yeah, that's, show okay. the conflict? Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. I, I think um, maybe I'm going to either clarify a question or if not, then I guess this is just my own question. Uh, but is it possible that a character that a plan which is consistent with the character's personality causes them to experience a negative emotion? So do you ever encounter a situation where a character is considering a plan and they have to decide between acting consistently with their personality and experiencing a negative emotion? I don't, does that I don't know if that either that's a clarification or maybe just my own question. So I, I think that, yeah, that, that's uh, t totally possible. So the, the characters are basically always striving for doing things that are consistent with, with their personality, regardless of their utility, I want to say. Because I'm also changing the definition of an explain action to go further beyond the utility to say, like, I could do something to feel happy for. I'm giving the medicine, for example, to a, a sick friend 
because I'm agreeable and I want to feel happy for, it is possible for me to do that. I'm basically sacrificing my ut utility in order to feel happy for. So it is kind of possible. Um, so my, my question, it's more rampant speculation, but, um, whenever, so like what you said just now, and, and while going through this presentation, one thing that I kept coming back to was the possibility of using this, um, like as part of an explanation system. Um, so like being able to say, you know, certain things happen because certain emotions are at play or it will cause an agent uh, to, to uh, feel a certain way. Do you think that's something that's, that's reasonable? Do you think that has merit? And uh, have you, uh, I don't know, given any thought to the, the other applications of this outside of maybe story storytelling and story generation? Yeah, definitely. I, I think... One of the important things that I do with the emotion model, I'm trying to scroll with it. I guess mm -hmm. this is this was kind of the, the expansion of the graph is kind of showing that like before we were trying to explain actions, uh, agents would only take actions if, they, if it, those actions contributed to their goals. Before we, we were limited to that. But now I'm saying, I can explain the actions of agents based on their emotions. So basically I would say, Tom just lost one of his coins to buy a sword. Why did he do that? I explain it using his, he did that to feel relief. So we can, ex yes. Oh, I was, it's a follow up once you're done. Mm -hmm. So yes, in, in the other, <coughs> excuse me, in the other applications we could also consider, we're trying to like, explain the actions of somebody in a in a system if we can assume their goals if the, we can assume what they are feeling at each moment so if we can basically create a player model for them then we can explain those actions based on the emotions that they're feeling after taking those actions Okay. Yeah, that was going to be my follow up is what are the kinds of things that you would need to, to do this, like, if you don't have necessarily a, a nice and neat story domain, like if I wanted to take some behavior traces that I've got in, in another project, what, what would we need to be able to, to, like, infer this type of emotion? And so answer being some kind of player model, some way to infer their, their goal. Um, okay, cool, cool. I guess um, one question. So one of the perspectives that I guess I didn't hear as much about as I thought I might was the perspective of somebody designing a game, right? And in the end, what this is, is, is a tool that, you know, has some abstractions built in that, you know, maybe are easier or harder to work with than other abstractions. There's probably lots of different ways to to slice and dice and get essentially the same behavior. Um, and so I'm curious, you know, to what extent, yeah, I, I don't quite know how to form a question out of that. It's just a, maybe an observation. And if you had some thoughts about either how you would evaluate that, or if they're, you know, maybe the what you think is the most useful pieces of this from a you know, from a game designer perspective, I, anyway, that, that was just a thought that wasn't fully baked into a question yet, but. Uh, I, I think one of the good things about the system is the white box nature of it. So it's like, as I showed some examples of, you see how the, the state space is expanded. It kind of provides opportunities for us to present to the author as they're making changes to their system, we can show them like how the hopes and fears of characters are changing, how their expectations of are changing. And we, as I said, we are kind of relying on the author to provide certain type of information. Uh, I think the most important one it, ones is 
the actions, the set of actions they need to provide, the personality of the character. And I, I included this slide. This is an example of how the author, how we could enable the author to determine the personality of the characters instead of telling them like, you have to know the five factors and you have to specify the value of each of the factors for each character. We can give them a set of adjectives to describe their characters, for example, and the inclusion and exclusion of an adjective in describing their, their characters could enable the system to uh, calculate their personality. So it, it is both good in the way that uh, the process is inspectable and we can present that process to the author to give them live feedback of the changes that they are making to the set of actions and to the, the variables that they're defining. And there are various ways that we could simplify them providing that information via, for example, these adjectives to describe the character's personality. Again, the goal is to reduce the amount of information that they need to provide as much as possible and provide the highest extent of automatic processing for them to view. So maybe, maybe one extra little nuance to the question. So I found myself wondering throughout to what extent you could just bake these things into the utility function for for a character and and is it is it the case that those are essentially like computationally like there's essentially equivalent things you could you could have this extra layering of emotion or you could just you know modify the utility function and you you could get the same behavior and so the real advantage is providing a better authoring interface or there's some fundamental differences that you know sort of things you can't bake into the utility mm -hmm. um that, that's actually a great question. Uh, some of the previous systems that I looked at, like specifically uh, Mark Rydell's work on personality recommendations was a, a, an example of what you just mentioned. Th what they did was basically for every action, they would also include this action is recommended for this kind of personality. So the author would actually would be baking the the kind of information into the action. So what I think what you're mentioning is like baking those things into the utility function. I'm using the system. We're basically, again, trying to minimize what you're, what we're asking of the author to provide in terms of the utility function. But then again, yes, that correlation exists. Like I'm defining the emotions in terms of the goals. So I'm saying like the character fears that their utility could decrease, the character hopes that it could decrease. So they are defined in terms of utility functions. And at the same time, I'm trying to avoid that baking. I'm trying to ask as, as little as possible from the author and let the system take the wheels. But, um, to build on Nathan's question though, I, so, I, of course, I agree with you that we don't want the author, it is burdensome for the author to have to go in and label every single action as belonging to this kind of personality. But could you bake that automatically, rather than asking a human author to hand label every kind of action and every kind of situation where that action might make sense? And, and this is kind of going also to the, the efficiency question, like possibly we could improve the efficiency of the process by sort of compiling out some amount of emotion and personality as a pre-processing step before the actual story generation, if that makes sense. Do you think that would be possible? I think we can approach this in two ways. Again, we are, are we considering presenting these processes to the author in a, in a design tool. In that case, it's better not to bake them. It's better, the system is good because it can describe emotional personality and utilities in simple terms for 
the layman author to just view to see how they look like. But if we approach it with the computational perspective, we want to create efficient algorithms to run for large story domains. Then yes, I I guess some that that has been an approach to try to compile this the information as much as possible in order to uh, facilitate the planning algorithm. So yeah, it, it depends on what perspective we're trying to do. And I guess we, we can do both using the system. I think maybe there's time for me to ask one of one of my questions, uh, obviously Alex and I have talked about this work a lot, so I didn't want to take up too much time. But one of the problems that I, in one of the great benefits of this work is that it allowed us to finally explain the kinds of stories we were trying to get out of the police use of force simulation. Like we were able to realize this is the story we want. Why can't we get it? Oh, okay. When we change the definitions this way, now we can get it. Um, but there were also a lot of situations where there were sequences of actions that were explained that we didn't want to be explained. And by, which is not the same thing as saying they're necessarily gonna end up in the story. But for example, the if we say the merchant uh, wants money, you could argue that the merchant would never sell the sword to the player in the first place because the merchant fears the player might attack her. Um, and so the merchant, there's an argument for, yes, the merchant sells the sword because the merchant gets money and, and improves her utility. So she, I guess, sells the sword to experience joy. But at the same time, she fears that what if I get attacked with the same sword? Um, and so how, how going forward would we deal with situations where there are lots of seemingly bad stories that are technically, like we, we've succeeded in explaining good stories that we're missing. Are we worried about accidentally explaining a bunch of bad stories that we want to continue to exclude. And a, a lot of things come to mind based on what you just explained. I'm trying to think of which one to talk about. So I guess I'll start with this. Uh, our experiment, the second experiment. One thing that uh, was good about the second ex experiment was to test out some of the new stories that we are now able to generate that we were not able to generate before. So for example, players acting on relief, unhappy for uh, those kind of stories and when players were put in those, into those situations, they chose to act emotionally rather than rationally. So that's one thing to mention. The other thing was about the merchant uh, expecting to get robbed by the but player, I, I could answer that in the current state of the system is that uh, the personality kind of helps with the situation because like selling the sword kind of opens, increases the intensity of the merchant's fears because now they would expect uh, to get robbed. So uh, uh, which one was it? The Openness, I guess, high open character would try to avoid uh, plans that are uh, increasing their fears. So it, in that situation, it wouldn't happen. And in the future state of the system, I could think of the system doing some more reasoning about character plans. Again, as I mentioned, like with the defining conflict in, term of, in terms of disappointment, we could do something like that to avoid those kind of stories. 
yes yeah, so your question had so many facets uh, to talk about Uh, okay, so we're we're at about four fifty. So I want to make a final call for questions, and then if there are no further questions, we may begin the deliberation. Great. Uh, nothing in the chat. Have, if we have just a minute, I have a quick question that's kind of off topic, but the it's about the Amazon Mechanical Turk for your data collection. Um, I, I'm not that familiar with the system and I haven't really thought it through with implications for data integrity. Can you comment briefly on any issues there with not knowing who the observers are or not knowing who the people are, any controls on uh, keeping the data sound, things like that? Yeah, th that is a great question. That is, I guess, one of the biggest problems of AMT, uh, Amazon's Mechanical Talk, Turk, is that I don't want to say a large part of, but a, a, a set of users are just looking for completing assignments as quick as po as quickly as possible, so that they can maximize their compensations. So that was that is that was and is uh, always a problem with the experiments. That how do we check for those kind of users? For some of the experiments, the, what I did was to ask them some comprehension questions. There were two possible ways. One way was I asked them a bunch of comprehension questions that would keep repeating on, until they would answer the correct question. So if they clicked randomly, they would get stuck at the questionnaire and the, I guess their option would be to withdraw and just receive the minimum compensation. The other option was to just let them complete the assignment and record those comprehension questions and then try to filter out those people who weren't able to answer like they uh, at, did they at least answer two out of three or four comprehension questions so yeah they were paying attention to the to the experiment so yeah that that, that is definitely a problem and what did their hourly rate work out to be about how much did they make for participating I don't know the hourly rate, I have to calculate that, but for an experiment such as this, uh, for this one, I guess that they had the option of withdraw from the application at any point, which would uh, give them one cent. And if they, if they completed this, the whole experiment, they would get uh, 75 cents. So, so for our, yes? It's significantly less than minimum wage, I'm assuming. I, I think so. A doctor work could kind of confirm on this. I, well, I don't do want you, to say not necessarily because this takes it's a very short experiment. I, I don't know if we have that data on on the, like the average completion time, but it was definitely minutes, not okay. you know hours or something. And did you do any kind of IRB approval for this? Is there something in place already that's for all of this kind of stuff? Yes, of course. Every experiment we had to go through thorough IRB applications before uh, we conducted them. Well, I'm actually on the IRB committee and I do a lot of enter research. Um, <clears throat> when it was first brought to IRB, there was some concern that you're paying them below minimum wage, substantially below. But the irony here is that IRB is historically more concerned about overpaying participants as if giving them $100 for an hour's work is coercion. And when in fact that what they want are people who are willing to participate for no money whatsoever. So there was actually a tremendous amount of irony to raise the concern that you're not paying them enough. And that is no longer a concern for the IRB. Okay. I think that's all I have, thank you. Great, okay, so at this point, we're gonna do the deliberation stage. So um, I would ask everyone to please just uh, leave the meeting and rejoin. Uh, if not, I can manually move you over to the waiting room. And I'm gonna move everyone uh, except the committee into the waiting room. And I will, Alex, I will call you back uh, when we are done. And this is, uh, it could, could be two minutes, it could be 30 minutes. So, you know, don't, please, please, wait around, go have a cup of coffee or something, and we will invite you back in, hopefully soon.
All right, Alex is returning. Hey, Alex, are you with us? May have stepped yes. away. Hey, mm -hmm. uh, congratulations. Congratulations, I'm, Dr. Shivani. Doctor. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm so pleased to, you're the first, first PhD student I've, I've had the chance to say this to. Congratulations on, on passing your dissertation defense. Uh, I'm, I'm incredibly proud of your work. Your committee was very impressed. Uh, we've got a handful of uh, bits of feedback, both for some changes to the document and some advice for when, when pitching this in future job talks and, uh, you know, like grant writing and that sort of stuff, uh, which you and I can follow up on. Uh, starting next week, but for now, congratulations! Go celebrate! You've you've passed your defense. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm so excited. <laughs> yep. Congrats, Alex, and thank yeah. you, Stephen, as well. Um, okay. Thanks, everyone. I actually have to go because I have uh, some pressing stuff. And I know it's probably it, everyone in mm -hmm. Eastern time. It's after five. So, uh, Alex, you and I will follow up. But uh, the short version is congratulations yes thank you take care thank you so much everyone for your time <laughs> have a good weekend